if you've ever wondered about the secret life of freaking flywheels, and I know you have, dude, this is the ghetto engineering dissertation for you. Rotational kinematics and little spooky feedback effects inside the cabin and things of that nature. We're going to cover it all off here and now. And it's all inspired by someone just like you, only named Serge, who is a loyal viewer and writes as follows. 12 months ago, I purchased a new 2022 Triton GLS manual via your service and my procurement decision was 100% based on your recommendation and the fact that you actually own one. Dude, at the risk of committing an act of abject sincerity, which would be a dangerous precedent for me, I am humbled when people do this. You know, it really reinforces to me the responsibility that underpins giving people advice about vehicles because we're talking about choices that are tens of thousands of dollars a throw. So I really hope this has been good advice for you, Serge, and uh, thank you for trusting me with that. Back to normal me now. Serge goes on and says, technical question. When I'm at a stop and take off from first gear, as I release the clutch and start accelerating, the gear shifter shudders for a few seconds. Little Queen Elizabeth II wave, just as the vehicle starts to roll forward. Well, obviously not Queen Elizabeth now, but in the good old days. Just like the Triton gear selector. So there's that. The Triton has a dual mass flywheel, Serge says, and first gear shutter on takeoff is a common quirk. However, some people on the Triton Facebook forums seem to think that this is more a problem with the tail shaft. Okay, we'll get into flywheel physics in just a sec, but a lot of people look for answers on various fora, and the problem with that is it's like skipping through a minefield. It's okay if you don't land on a mine. So some people on forums are very helpful and they've got a lot of experience, but some people are just Dunning-Kruger effect dickheads. And the only problem with that is they can both sound exactly the freaking same. So it's dangerous getting advice from forums because you don't know if you're going to make a critical decision based on some Dunning-Kruger effect dickhead, which is the real risk here. Serge goes on and says, My Triton has been... Doing this since day one, and it now has 5,000 Ks on the Odo. They're 100% highway Ks. Okay, so one of the positive things here is, and it's very difficult to diagnose something by email, but if something's been behaving in a particular way for 5,000 kilometers, and that behavior is not evolving, like it's not getting worse, then it's probably an operational characteristic. And you could easily get that confirmed at a dealership, right? Problems tend to get worse in the context of 5,000 Ks. Like if you've got a problem with the drive line, it's gonna get worse in 5,000 Ks of normal driving, it just is. Whereas if something's just a less than perfect operational characteristic, it's really likely to stay the same. We'll get into that in a bit more detail in a minute. Serge goes, I'd really appreciate if you could confirm if this is indeed a normal characteristic of the manual Triton and if it's indeed caused by the dual mass flywheel or potentially something else. That's a great question, Serge. Thank you very much for it. And once again, I do appreciate the trust, dude. That means a lot to me. Now, I want to go back and talk about flywheels. WTF are they, dude? Because if you look at industrial revolution machinery, like rotating machinery, steam engines, and things of that nature. They've all got this giant cast iron flywheel that's got spokes, maybe five or six spokes, and a big, heavy cast iron mass right around the circumference to give it maximum rotational inertia, right? angular momentum, kinetic energy, things of that nature. That's what flywheels are all about. Because if you've got, let's say you've got a single cylinder combustion engine, like a an old diesel single cylinder Lister engine or something of that nature, it'll have a big flywheel because it's only got one cylinder and it's only doing relatively low speed, rotational speed. And it's only firing, if it's a four stroke, it's only firing once 
every two revs. So you're getting one thump from the piston, and then the crankshaft has to go one, two, and then dish. That's a lot of time between dishes, isn't it, right? Like it's a lot of angular dwell time. And what you want to do with anything that's got a rotating shaft, like a machine, it can be a grinder, whatever, it doesn't matter. You want to extract useful work out of it more or less continuously. And certainly that's the case in a car. It's the case with a lawnmower, like the disc with the blades on it. It's a single cylinder lawnmower, four stroke probably. But the disc is a flywheel. It'd be much rougher without that. So basically, a flywheel gives you angular kinetic energy on tap continuously in between the firing pulses. It's got rotational momentum, like angular momentum. And that allows you to draw whatever work you need out of it more or less continuously. If it had no inertia, it would grind to a stop in between the firing pulses and you don't want that. So obviously if we move into cars and you've got V8 engines, which are highly desirable for two things, because they got mumbo, but also because they're smooth. And they're smooth because there's a lot of firing pulses in every rev. In a V8 engine, there's a firing pulse every 90 degrees of crankshaft rotation. Whereas if you come back to a four cylinder engine, there's only a firing pulse every 180 degrees. So it's going dish, 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 like this on the way around, right? For the crankshaft. That's also a lot of dwell time in between, you know, firing pulses. So you need a flywheel to try and absorb that. When you build a reasonably big four cylinder engine in the ballpark of two and a half liters, which is roughly you know, proportional to a five litre V8 kind of thing in terms of the size of each cylinder. The Triton's 2.4, it's in that ballpark, but it's also force fed. So you're feeding it more air than an Atmo engine could drink and you're increasing the size of the pulse, right? Because it's being force fed air and it's a reasonably big per cylinder engine configuration anyway. So it's douche and nothing dish and nothing, dish and nothing, like this in slow-mo, that's how it rolls. So there's a hack with the flywheel, right? You don't have to have a solid flywheel. If you're a proper clever dick with a pointy cap and a, you know, windmill thing on the front of it, then an engineer working in R&D, in other words, then you can go, hmm, let's separate the two halves of the flywheel. Let's get the half of the flywheel connected to the crank and separate it from the half of the flywheel connected to the clutch, the transmission, the drive line, and we'll put a spring in between them so that they can move, the two halves can move in an angular sense relative to each other. So what happens is you get a firing pulse, doosh, like this, that speeds up the part of the flywheel connected to the crank there's a spring there, it compresses the spring, which, sm which further smooths out the impulse of the uh, into the other half of the flywheel. So you've got this spring compression, which is essentially stored energy. So in between the pulses, the spring releases that energy into the driveline via this half of the flywheel, and it gets even smoother. So yay! There's only one problem with that. Well, there's actually two problems, but the big problem here is complexity being the enemy of reliability. Because if you think about an engine doing 3,000 RPM, that's an easy number, 50 revs a second, that means basically that there would be 100 revs, 100 firing pulses every second, because there's two, two firing pulses per rev in a four-cylinder. And essentially, that means the springs are operating 100 times a second, okay? Or whatever that is, like um, uh, 12,000 times a minute. Don't quote me on that, but it's something of that nature. The point I'm making is that the springs do their thing millions of times. And 
this impacts reliability. Dual mass flywheels wear out. Whereas old style single mass flywheels do not wear out. They're expected to essentially last the life of the engine, right? So you've got the complexity versus reliability dilemma with a dual mass flywheel. And at some point in time, they will croak and they will need replacement. And it's not gonna be cheap, but unlikely at 5,000 Ks, I'd suggest. So what's more likely to be happening here, and I'm just hypothesizing now, but what's more likely is that the springs are doing their thing in the flywheel and there's another spring in the clutch, isn't there? Because of the whole uh, kinetic versus uh, static coefficient of friction, right? Now this is the bit where people's ears and eyes st start to bleed. So if that's you, just click away, dude. When you feel it about to happen, just click away. You might not need to know this. It might not be worth it. But there's a difference between kinetic friction and static friction. And you've experienced it when you get two very large South Pacific Islander types delivering a fridge. You know, they've got a whole fridge and they pick it up like this. And they go, here's your fridge. Right? And you go... And you try and get it across the floor and it's really hard and finally you get it to move and it goes, ah, it starts to move. And it seems somehow easier if you just keep it moving just a little bit. But if you let it stop, it's really hard again, right? And this is because static friction is greater than dynamic friction, like kinetic friction. Something's moving, it's easier to keep it moving on the surface than it is to get it moving again if you let it stop. And this, of course, is what happens inside a clutch when you take off, only it's dynamic, like kinetic friction first because the clutch plate is moving relative to the surface of the flywheel and the pressure plate. And then when it actually hooks up and the clutch fully engages, <laughs> static friction, right? And if you didn't do something to attenuate that, that'd be like in the back of everyone's head every time the clutch engages. So you'd just be inching forward, you get to that point of clutch engagement and then in the back of the head. Nobody wants that. So they put these springs, these viscoelastic springs inside the clutch plate so that the clutch plate can absorb the slap in the back of their head before it gets to the splines on the gearbox input shaft. And I suspect that what's happening here is there is a feedback effect in between the springs in the dual mass flywheel doing their bit to absorb the pulses and the springs in the clutch on take up. And that leads to Queen Elizabeth II waving, right, on the transmission selector. So why do they allow this to happen? Because it could be engineered out, right? And I'd suggest if it was a 7 Series BMW or a 5 Series or something, that would be unacceptable. But in a ute, like utes are primarily designed for industry, agriculture, mining, forestry, things of that nature, road building, construction generally. And in that context, it doesn't matter at all. Queen Elizabeth can wave all she wants. It's just that in Australia, we've got this kind of unique phenomenon where car makers have discovered that it's highly profitable to put all the fruit in a ute and sell it to a freaking suit, right? And that's great, except the fruit is kind of like lipstick on a pig, in a sense, right? Because I'm not suggesting that the utes themselves are pigs, because I own one and I'm quite happy with it, but what I'm suggesting is that the fundamental design is kind of a pig in the context of refinement. It's not really important. When you're you know, driving across some paddock with some hay or you, you need to fix a windmill down the back paddock, do you really care? Like, no, you don't, dude. You just get out there and do your thing and come back and have a few cans at the end of the day. But your suit wants his luxury and looks at the gearbox, he looks at the shifter doing this on takeoff every freaking time and goes, I paid for the leather, paid for the GPS, right? And so there's kind of that phenomenon in play. This is allowed to happen because for most utes, it just doesn't matter. They're driving across a paddock all day, right? Or building a road or something. They got all these dudes in them with hard hats and high vis and they don't care about that shit.
But you do if you buy a GLS or a Rugged X or a Wild Track or something like that because you're a suit and you've paid for the fruit and you want the refinement, but the platform is fundamentally not engineered for that kind of thing. So you see these little refinement faux pas coming out in fully loaded utes all the time. Each fully loaded ute has a different set of refinement faux pas. They just do. And the only thing I'd suggest is just live with it, dude, because, hey, you bought a ute, you didn't buy a 7 Series kind of thing. Now, if you're really concerned about anything with your car, not just Queen Elizabeth Wave on the selector, but anything else, it's always a really good idea when you've got a service coming up to put it in writing. Like, I would book the service in writing, and when they say, is there anything else that you'd like us to look at, you just describe it there. Take a freaking screenshot and store it in the cloud in your Google Drive or something because down the track, if it all blows up like 12 months out of warranty, the gearbox waves like this and then punches a hole in the floor, then you can say, but hang on a minute, I raised this with you at the first service and the second service and you told me that was an operational characteristic and she was all good, so... What are you going to do about it? I think you should look after me under consumer law. If you've got some evidence to that effect, it strengthens your claim, right? So don't just roll with it, flag it. But if they say, hey, no, dude, they're all like that, then, you know, kind of live with it, but at least then you've got the record in case something goes wrong. So anyway, that's my ghetto engineering dissertation on flywheels and how they work and dual mass flywheels in particular. If you've got your hands on these things on a regular basis, you're pulling them apart and refurbishing them, and I got anything wrong, please let it be known in the comments. The other thing I'd suggest is that if you do enough research online, you will find single mass flywheel conversion kits, which are available in the aftermarket industry. So the time to fit them would typically be when the clutch dies because, you know, you're going to be pulling all of that crap apart anyway and you'll have access to the flywheel and it's pretty easy to fit a new flywheel at that point without incurring much additional labour cost. The only thing I'd suggest is that car makers fit dual mass flywheels to engines for a reason and the reason... Dish, dish. It's to absorb that. So they go to this extra cost and complexity to bother to absorb that. And you might be royally pissed off if your flywheel fails at, I don't know, 160,000 Ks and it's a fairly large bill to replace it. But you've had all of that absorption of what they call torsional vibration, but it's really just absorption of the firing pulses, right? You've had that, and that has made the in-cab experience a little more refined, even though you're in the lipstick pig sort of paradigm. If you fit a solid flywheel, you are going to experience a bit more of that every time you drive down the road, 12,000 times a minute at 3,000 RPM. And it's also going to have powertrain, consumer law, entitlement kind of consequences down the track. So if there's a problem with an aftermarket component of that nature that you fit and the engine decides that it's going to go poopy in its trousers and write its barrister a stern letter of complaint, then if you fitted a big fat aftermarket part like that, it's going to be a lot harder, nigh on impossible, I'd suggest, to get any sort of consumer law rectification from the car maker. So nothing in life is free, everything's a compromise, and I would just be living with the on-takeoff Queen Elizabeth wave, especially as in Serge's case, it's a 100% highway car, so how often are you taking off anyway, dude?